This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Different from his and from others. 
So while Godfrey Smith um, focuses particularly on three properties as mutually determining um, whether an object is able to participate in evolution by natural selection, so he focuses on the bottlenecked germ lines and integration. Um, what I call my levels of selection account sort of subsumes those three properties within a more general, functionally defined category that I just call individuating mechanisms. And then Godfrey Smith's three mechanisms are sort of um, just three among many possible realizers of that functional role. So I'll give you my definition before I say more about how to fill in the role. Um, and this is all very dry and abstract um, at the moment, I realise, but it will get more fun, I promise. So I say that an evolutionary individual is a collection of living parts where a population of such collections has some capacity for responding to selection at the between collection level because of the action of individuating mechanisms. So the individual is defined in terms of its possession of mechanisms that ground a particular capacity to participate in a process of natural selection. <coughs> um, and I then give a functional account of what it is to be an individuating mechanism which allows kind of multiple different mechanisms to play a role. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time dwelling on these here because they're not so important, but there's two types of mechanism and they work together to fix an object's um, individuality. So there's policing mechanisms. These bind the parts of an evolutionary individual together um, by inhibiting their ability to be selected independently of one another. Um, so they provide unity to the parts. And then demarcation mechanisms um, sort of supply heritable variants in fitness so that individuals can respond to selection in their own right, sort of independently of other bits of biological uh, matter. So they sort of give the evolutionary autonomy. Um, so there are loads and loads of different ways to realise these mechanism types, and they vary across different lineages. So they'll be different, they'll be played by different, the role will be played by different mechanisms in different cases. Um, Developmental bottlenecks that Dr. Smith focuses on are one example that can do the role, but they're absent from some lineages that use different mechanisms to do the same sort of job. Um, immune systems are another example of a mechanism that can play the, the policing role. Um, and sexual fertilization is something that's often you know, always playing a demarcation role. So, together, these two types of mechanisms control um, the way in which heritable variants in fitness appears at different levels and thus determine whether or not a population of objects is able to respond to natural selection sort of at its own at their own level rather than as mere parts or aggregates of, of bigger or smaller objects. Um, one thing that's important is that um, Evolutionary individuality on this view is a scalar or gradient property, so it's not an all or nothing matter. Um, any collection of living parts can have more or less individuality. Um, and they can have it at multiple hierarchical levels simultaneously. They don't always, but they can. Um, so it's implied that evolutionary individuals, if they're, into, if they're individuated to an intermediate extent, they can have parts that are also evolutionary individuals. And it's really only paradigm organisms by which I mean horses and tigers and people um, that are sort of exclusive or near exclusive evolutionary individuals. So they've got their capacity only at their own hierarchical level. And most living stuff is marginal, it's not like that. It's just got some degree or other. Okay, so the concept generates verdicts about. Uh, the extent to which actual lumps of matter um, exhibit individuality. So, for example, mitochondria are not individuals but parts because uh, they can't be selected independently of the cells of which, that, that house them. Um, ecosystems are closer to being paradigm um, groups because they do have parts that are under, able to undergo differential uh, selection from one another. Um, and ultimately, a concept of this evolutionary individual 
is evaluated according to whether or how closely it gets these verdicts right. So what does it mean to get the verdict right? Well, this is where we look at the theoretical role that this concept is playing. So we count individuals and their offspring um, in order to measure their fitness so that we construct models um, whose aim is to predict how traits change over time on the reaction of natural selection. And the primary criterion for evaluating these sorts of concepts just consists in checking its ability to support that theoretical role. So does it pick out the right objects where the rate of increase of that type of object is informative about the process of evolution by natural selection? So if we count the objects picked out by the definition, do we correctly calculate the future frequencies of traits in the population? Um, the more often and the more accurately the correct objects are picked out, the better the definition. So I count sort of broad applicability across the whole tree of life as a virtue. It's less than ideal if the definition works well for vertebrates but can't deal with anything else. A definition that copes with vertebrates and, vert and non-vertebrates would be better. Okay, so that's the end of the really abstract bit. I'm going to um, talk through at least one example to explain why it can be tricky to find this evolution individual. So, starting with plants. One of the things that's really important we avoid in identifying an evolutionary individual is mixing up an individual's offspring with its parts. So, I mustn't mistake my arm for my son. Um, my son is an evolutionary individual in his own right, or my arm is merely one of my parts. Um, my son appeared in a process that we call reproduction, while my arm <coughs> appeared in a process that we call development or growth. And luckily it's really easy to tell the difference because sons only appear after a particular sequence um, in which two individuals come together, um, specialised parts, gametes, I mean, uh, fuse, <laughs> and everything that follows <laughs> is son, is reproduced individual, not part. At least, this is the story as invented by Thomas Henry Huxley in 1852. So he said that all the developmental product of uh, sexual fertilisation event or zygote parts one individual. Um, and as for plants, some botanists have chosen to stick to the same script, and they also focus on sexual fertilisation as defining the life cycle, and they call all the developmental products of one fertilised zygote just parts of an individual, which is known as the genequeue. The trouble is that as we've seen a little bit already, plants aren't like people, they do all sorts of things that we can't do. So we can't grow a new element by tearing off my arm and sticking it in a jug of water. Um, and the reason we can't do that is that the cells that make up my arm have been sort of neutered or blinkered. Um, so they're only able to perform a really limited class of the functions that you might have sort of latent in their genotype. Um, and the only cells that are sort of free um, three of those shackles are my gametes, and they're only located in my ovaries. So plant cells instead are much less limited. Um, although they do take on uh, different developmental roles, they're free to sort of change their mind and switch roles when circumstances demand it. So if a twig is ripped from a stem and pumped in water, some of the cells can just switch roles um, and start growing roots, and a new stem, and branches, and finally a whole new plant. Um, and a plant that's produced in that way is often going to look exactly like a plant that's grown from seed. Um, some of the plants that have been injured, if you've ever sort of seen a tree that's been knocked over in a storm, sometimes you get roots kind of growing out of funny places where the tree's been broken and fallen over and it'll grow a whole new tree. Um, so this is called adventitious growth or somatic embryogenesis. Um, and the same capacity allows plants to clone themselves, to grow new plants from the ends of runners that can be either um, under or below or above the ground. Um, lots of the plants that you see around you will have been produced in this way, rather than from seed. Although it's kind of hard to tell at a glance. Um, the difference is that clones are vegetatively produced, so they're genetic copies of one another. 
So what looks like a row of plants sort of grown from a row of seeds can often just be a row of clonal iterations. What looks like a, a forest of separate trees may actually be a stand of interconnected clones. Okay, so to those biologists who stick to Huxley's definition of the individual in terms of sexual fertilization, these um, clone parts are never individuals, they're just growth, they're just new parts. So a group of clones, which botanists call a genet, is just one individual. Other people disagree, so supporters of a rabbit view say that the clonal units are not the genet, is what, dis what often displays a life cycle. Um, it looks like, a, like an individual, it sort of has the sort of physiological and reproductive autonomy and unity that we expect from individuals. So they say that clonal iteration really is um, reproduction, it's not just growth. And one case where this starts to get interesting is when we think about examples of plant species, plant species in which there is no zygote cycle, because reproduction only occurs clonally. So for example, there's this plant called hydrilla, um, and all of the hydrilla plants in California are female, so there's never any sexual fertilization. Only females of that species have made it to that part of the world. And supporters of the genet view have to assign those plants a fitness <coughs> that is zero. So they're viewed as sterile, they're incapable of reproducing. Yet this plant is so successful that it's being classified as an invasive species. It's completely taking over and choking out all the waterways throughout Florida that they're trying to get rid of. So, it seems a bit odd to say they've got zero fitness. Um, and basically, genetic theorists were taught that, well, success like that is only going to be short-lived. So sex is essential to providing variation and also vulnerability. Uh, it's essential to purging deleterious mutations that would otherwise accumulate. So it's, it's got no future. But there's no good evidence for this assert assertion. Um, so the situation is, is really a stalemate. They're making completely different predictions about the future of this plant. Uh, they're making, they're assuming completely different explanations for the role of sex. You know, it's not it's not a small matter. How am I doing? Okay, I am going to skip the bacterial example because I'm going too slowly. So another obvious shortcoming of Huxley's definition is that it only applies to sexual organisms and um, bacteria are not sexual in at least the normal sense of the word, they divide by binary fission. Um, so sex is essential to being an individual. Well, if sex is essential to a species having any evolutionary future, well then anyone looking at bacteria is going to change their mind. It just it wouldn't make any sense to say the bacteria have no future. <laughs> so I was going to say a little bit about um, biofilms. Um, some people have said that biofilms reproduce at the colony, colony level. Um, and this would be a sort of fission as well, in a sense. You can think of the biofilm as kind of fissioning and, and both parts um, then being offspring. Um, and my main criticism of that really is that the offspring, the fission parts are unlikely to have enough heritability to really count as offspring of the parent uh, colony. Um, but I'm not going to go into that. What I want to really use these examples to show um, is that there are real cases in which uh, there's no sharp distinction between reproduction and growth, in which Real processes that occur exemplify instances in which the new part sort of gradually becomes an offspring, rather than there being any sharp discontinuity in the process in which now um, it's a new individual instead of a part of the old one. So clonal iteration, I think, is sort of somewhere between growth and reproduction, and whether a clonally produced Rabbit is a new individual depends on things like how much variation it's able to, to accumulate and on its degree of, sort of physiological independence from the parent plant. 
And both of those properties are things that can be happening to a, big, a greater or lesser extent. They might change slowly over time. So there just isn't going to be a sharp line there in the chrono case. So, assuming there is that ambiguity, I want now to talk about what I think the implications are for biological individuality. Sorry. Okay, so let's suppose that we're considering two biological objects, X and Y. At first blush, we might say that there are two classes of identity relation that can hold between the two objects identity and non identity. But we can think of identity as synchronically or diachronically, and I'm starting with synchronic. I think an evolutionary approach would say that a synchronic identity relation holds between X and Y if they're both parts of a single evolutionary individual. Whereas a relation of non identity holds of X and Y different evolutionary individuals. So in the first case, there's just one evolutionary individual, in the second case, there are two. And you can kind of view definitions of the evolutionary individuals focusing all their efforts on distinguishing these two cases. So identity obtains if there are mechanisms that bind the evolutionary fates of X and Y together. Um, so they lack independence. But in fact, evolutionary biology accords great significance to some extra categories, some sort of subcategories we might consider them of non-identity. So of singular importance, is reproduction. So this relation holds when X is parent of Y. Um, and without this class, there would be no evolution by natural selection because there would be no lineages. Um, another class that's really important to biologists is common species. So X is a different individual of the same species as Y. And then finally, there are cases in which X is a distinct individual of different species from Y. Um, so we can put some paradigm examples in to help us remember what we're talking about. So my arm and my nose are both parts of a single individual, Ellen. Um, reproduction, as in all sort of placental mammals, for the reproduction relation to hold, um, it's got to be the right sequence, um, fertilization and development of birth. Um, John and I are distinct individuals from members of the same species, while a horse is a distinct individual from a different now, notice that I'm only putting evolutionary individuals on here. So the table is not intended to classify non-living things like hair clippings or arguably viruses. Um, it's not categorizing elements of the extended mind like notepads. Um, it's not worrying about uh, features of the extended phenotype that are abiotic. So it's not distinguishing them from the environment. So there's lots of things it's not doing, it's not trying to do. Um, um, they're interesting things to do nonetheless. Um, now, the interesting bit for me came when I was trying to um, spell out the differences between these different classes, these classes of identity relations, or if you like, on the board. So, the first crucial variable I think is similarity. So, the replicator view and the classical view disagree about whether natural selection requires clonal copying at some level or not. But both agree that phenotypically speaking, the parents must be similar to their offspring if evolution is to happen. And in particular, it requires high similarity between parents and offspring, although not too high. So evolution depends on there being the right balance between variation and heredity. Without variation, there can be no change. Without heredity, the change can't be cumulative. So sexual organisms have sort of struck one balance there, so 50% of the genome is passed on. Um, but non-sexual organisms can add variation in other ways. So they can use ratchets to magnify the effect of mutation, or they can use lateral gene transfer. Um, by the way, genes are just merely one important cause of similarity of phenotypes. So it's not only genetic similarity that I'm talking about here. Um, weirdly, at least on this kind of synchronic version of the view, I've spelled out the identity relation doesn't require similarity. In other words, you know, the parts of a single bacteria don't have to be similar 
to one another in any sense to be part of a single bacterium and an endosymbiont doesn't need to be similar to its host um, in any way. But now there should be some similarity for the same species relation as well, although a bit less, and really none expected for the non-identity relation. Um, another crucial distinction, again sort of skipping over subtleties, subtle differences between formal and versus, versus material accounts of replication, the cause of the similarity matters. In particular, the parent should cause the offspring to be similar. So a swamp man copy of me wouldn't be my offspring any more than my sister or my father are my offspring. And obviously there's a lot of work to do to spell out exactly what we mean by caused in the right way. Um, the same species relation, interestingly, um, requires a common phylogenetic cause. The final crucial variable is independence. So X and Y should be independent of one another in every case except that of identity. Um, by the way, I'm talking about evolutionary independence here. Um, so the objects in the last three classes exhibit the capacity to respond to natural selection um, in their own right. Um, one way I, I really didn't think about that is just to ask the question, if I had a whole bunch of these things and nothing else, would you get any evolution by natural selection or not? Okay, so these parameters Again, I'm sort of taking them as implied by, um, by standard accounts of um, evolutionary biology. They're, they're also derived from Lewontin indirectly. Um, so similarity that's caused in the right way can sort of be understood as a way of spelling out heritability and independence is um, the sort of capacity for fitness variants. Um, what I really want to emphasize for today's purposes is the, the artificiality of the boundaries between these classes. So we can make generalisations like these by considering the properties of paradigm examples like people and tigers. Um, but if we put bacterial cells in instead of humans, and especially if we switch to a di diachronic view, which might be the right way to think about identity anyway, I'm not sure, um, then we start to see that actually Similarity sort of decreases smoothly as we move from identity through the other classes of non-identity, just as the number of sort of causal steps or, or nodes in the lineage increases smoothly. Um, they don't really need to be sharp thresholds. And in fact, this is just as true for paradigms on a diachronic view. Um, it's just that because we've got much slower life cycles, we don't usually think about people in that way. But the level of identity between humans decreases smoothly as you increase the phylogenetic distance between sort of your X and Y. Um, so, I mean, Thomas had some slides yesterday with some diagrams that made this point much better than I'm really making it, but all of the sort of same vaguenesses in speciation processes occur just as much for these organism level processes. And clonal plants make it clear that this vagueness um, occurs even across the much smaller reproductive timescales. So the process of a part becoming an offspring can happen gradually. And there can be cases that are intermediate between being a part and an offspring. <coughs> um, so one of my um, one of the sort of messages I want to advocate today is that this really should be the default view rather than there being um, sharp categories. Now there are cases that challenge even this relaxed picture, just as it was in biology, there's always a, another problem case. Um, I think I'll skip alternating generations and just talk about polyploidy. So, back to plants again. Um, so, another amazing plant biology is that they're, they're really keen polyploiders. Um, so, this isn't a process that only happens in plants, but it happens in them a lot. Um, and it's basically to put it simply, occurs when the DNA actually accidentally gets doubled during a reproduction event. So the offspring have um, double the number of chromosomes as the parent. Um, so if X is a plant and Y is its polyploid offspring, where would it go on this schema? It's, it's standard reproduction apart from a, a sort of error in the process. 
too many chromosomes mate. But the thing is that the resultant Y, the offspring, it can't mate with individuals of the same species as its parents, um, because it hasn't got the right number of chromosomes to pair up with, they all need to find a partner. It can mate with other individuals that have also undergone polyphony. So according at least to certain species definitions, the offspring actually constitute a new species, a separate species from the parent. Botanists consider polyploidization, autopolyploidy, to be a, an instantaneous speciation event. Um, so these cases are sort of indeterminate between reproduction and complete non-identity, being a different species. Um, and botanists are really keen on polyploidy because the result for some reason is often a plant that's kind of larger and more vigorous than its parent. Um, so what we're seeing here is a diagram in which one part of a tomato plant has been treated with chemicals to become polyploid. So according to some species concepts at least, this plant has one part, one branch, which is a different species to the rest of the plants. So that's just a nice example of, where did you put that? I don't know. Um, and similarly, some of the cases that we've already talked about, so fusions and um, regeneration, I don't know if they deserve their own categories or where they go on a diagram like this, but they make it obvious that it's not neat. Um, so, for the last part, I wanted to ask very speculatively what all this means, if anything, for humans. Um, so, if biological identity isn't sharply distinguished from non-identity, uh, what does that matter? Is it odd to suppose that there can be ambiguity about whether I'm myself or not? Um, you know, is it odd to say that maybe some people have more personal identity than others? Um, maybe the extent to which we're self-identical sort of changes during our lifetime. Maybe we have different levels of personal identity at different stages during our life. Um, if you don't like all that, if that you know, if there might be very good reasons for rejecting all that, then that might be a reason to decouple personal identity from, from at least an evolutionary concept of the biological individual. Might be a reason to say that it can't be based on this. You might have to look elsewhere and you might find a non-evolutionary account of the biological individual that avoids those problems. Um, on the other hand, you might say, well, I don't know, those are all really weird examples, but you know, life is just weird. Um, most of the cases I've been discussing, there's no question of them having um, you know, sentience or any of those faculties that we associate with personal identity. So maybe let's just be more anthropomorphic, anthropocentric, um, and focus only on humans. We don't care about the personal identity of starfish or plants. Um, so humans, they do have sex and they do have fairly clear physical boundaries. Um, you now the paradigm reproduces, so these problems don't occur for humans, maybe. I'm not sure that's going to work either. I mean, as many people are spelling out, arguably, um, we do have certain parts, like symbiotes, for example, but we only have them to a particular degree. Um, and even if we have fairly clear spatial boundaries, I still think there are some senses in which we have vague temporal boundaries. <coughs> so one thing that Elseling King has been talking about really nicely is gestation or motherhood. So. Um, Elsalin asks the question um, whether the fetus is a separate individual contained in the mother like a tub of yogurt, or uh, is it better conceived as one of her parts until it's born? Um, and my perspective on this is that um, well, both identity and reproduction involve high levels of similarity, and what really distinguishes them is independence, the possibility of fitness variants, you know, so offspring but not parts have independent evolutionary futures, they can compete against one another. Um, and sexual fertilisation, it creates dissimilarity sharply, but fetal independence only appears really gradually. You know, there's no point before the age of about 18, I think, um, when the offspring are no, okay. Maybe there's no point in which they're truly independent. But certainly, although, so Elsie focuses on some points in which there's a relatively sharp increase in the level of independence, such as birth, um, it's fairly smooth all the way through. Um, 
And I also worry about canids because they're also very different from the parent, right? They're, they're just as different from the parent as gametes are from a zygote. Um, and there's no step change there in independence either. It only appears gradually. Um, so I wonder, you know, should we be considering gametes as organisms? I'm not sure. Um, another good concern <coughs> that Jasper talks about really nicely concerns mitochondrial DNA donors. So there are cases in which, um, yeah, specifically a mother has some sort of genetic disorder which means that her mitochondria are faulty in some sense. Um, what they can do to allow them <coughs> children is transplant some mitochondria from a donor into her egg so that she can have healthy offspring. Um, and there's been a kind of legal ruling recently about whether the donor of the mitochondria counted as a third parent or not, and it was decided no. So she didn't get it. The mitochondrial donor doesn't get any of the sort of legal um, status we normally associate with parenthood. But, you know, it raises the question, why not? Certainly heritability there. We normally think of heritability, well, in, in the normal human reproduction, heritability is across the whole organism. Both parents contribute to the heritability of all the traits. But this is trait-specific heritability. So there are a very good example of a parent with respect to a very limited class of the organism's total traits. Um, it's just one amongst many cases where we might consider an organism as having many parents, in fact, because they respect the appropriate relations of similarity that's caused in the right way. Um, cloning, which we can't do yet, but maybe we will in the future um, be able to sort of reprogram somatic cells to become gametes and, or some other way of cloning ourselves. And there's been a, an interesting discussion in bioethics about whether a cloned copy of yourself should qualify as your offspring as opposed to your delayed twin. Whether if you clone yourself, some people think that your parents gain a new child rather than you being the um, parent of the clone. Um, and here I think it just depends on what we think, what we said the right causal relation is. It, 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 I think it seems closer to the production of an offspring because twins don't usually be <coughs> causally responsible for one another. Um, so, so these are all cases that are going to put pressure, even in the human case, on these nice sharp distinctions. Okay, so, these are my conclusions. Um, the level of selection account picks evolutionary individuals out in terms of their capacity to undergo evolution by natural selection at one level rather than another. So it tells us whether two objects are parts of a single evolutionary object or not. But in fact, there are various uh, biologically important ways of not being part of a single individual. So different sorts of non-identity relation that hold between organisms. The reproduction in particular um, is an evolutionary crucial kind of hinterland between identity and non-identity. Um, but the boundaries between them and between identity and non-identity are not sharp. Um, and the vagueness in these boundaries is a consequence of the fact that the component properties, so similarity, causal closeness and independence, those are gradient properties that an object can have more or less of. Um, whether that's a problem for personal identity or not, I'm not sure. But, uh, yeah, I hope you'll tell me. <laughs>